Okay. Is it clear? Because I should not speak like this because I can't be sitting like this the whole time. So I should. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, very good. Very good. <laughs> okay. Let me check carefully. <laughs> so, good morning. How many of you read Shanti Deva's book, Bodhisattva Way of Life? Only a few people. You should read that book. Anyway, the reason I'm mentioning this book is right in the beginning, the book says, um, Parse. So he was basically saying that with the composition of this book, I have nothing new to say which has not been said before. Now even if there's nothing new to say that has not been said before, but if the writing style is very beautiful, poetic, then it will be enjoyable. My, my composition is also not that beautiful. So therefore, I have no wish to benefit others. However, people who are of similar fortune or fate like me, maybe they get a little bit benefit. Shanti Deva, such a great teacher, great practitioner, out of humility he says that. Of course, he has a lot to say. But in my case, this is more than true because I have nothing new to say, perhaps, maybe for some, maybe a little bit. So here in the next, I think, kind of six days, 19th and 20th morning, there is no class here. I'm sure you know because His Holiness the Dalai Lama is giving teaching, so you all will be going down 19th and 20th morning. And then we finish the teaching uh, on 22nd before lunch, right? So, so, <laughs> so therefore, I, I really think I have nothing special or much to offer. But, uh, but this kind of gathering is very important. It's very, very important. This is actually showing the force of good things. So my talking is really like preaching the converts. Many of you may be much, much better than me in many ways, in terms of gentleness, in terms of goodness, in terms of knowledge. Many of you, I'm sure, be much, much better than me. So it's really not so much about my sharing things. But I'm not saying that my presence here is total, you know, useless, totally useless, <laughs> because what I'm teaching is not my uh, thing. It is based on the teaching of the Buddha and great teachers. So their teaching is important. I'm like a messenger. That way it will be beneficial. But what is important is that first of all, we should think about the reason why we have gathered here. You are not here, you know, coming from different places. Some of you coming maybe quite far off places. Definitely not, definitely not, to, not to waste your time. And uh, especially this is a residential course primarily, so you will be more or less confining yourself which is actually good because much of the problem that we are facing today is our not being in touch with oneself. It is not so much about you not keeping in touch with others. 
for keeping in touch with, with others, there are many technological products. <laughs> Internet is there, mobile phone is there, different types of technological gadgets are there to communicate with others, right? But how would you communicate to yourself? Send an email to yourself. You can do that, but that is a little bit ludicrous, right? So the, and then also keeping in touch with the higher beings, like if there is a God, if you're a believer in God, or Buddha, or higher beings, internet doesn't work there, right? Your gadgets doesn't work. And I've seen gadgets actually doesn't work when you really need them. Very interesting. When there's a flood, a famine, you know, lightning, then is the time you really need them. They doesn't work. Connection is not there. <laughs> so why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because the best connection is connection of your mind to others and connecting your mind to yourself. At the very outset, it, this should become very clear that much of the problem that we are seeing in the world today is starvation of human mind. The more and more we are becoming extrovert, the more and more we are chasing the external products and getting distracted with technological and scientific products. And now artificial intelligence is also there, which will distract you even more. Right? So, so all kind of problems, including issues of health, diseases, depression, low self-esteem, all this is because you don't realize the potential of your mind. You are not in touch with yourself. So the first thing that you should really remember is how to take care of yourself by constantly in touch with yourself, how, you, how, how to love yourself, how to be compassionate to yourself. That is, I think, is the most important. I'm not just saying it. The Buddha said that self is the protector of the self. No one else can be the protector, in the true sense of the term. <laughs> Similarly, self is the enemy of the self. No one else can be your enemy. And if you discipline your mind properly, that's the way to achieve higher states like enlightenment. And this is not an easy job, because when you talk about keeping in touch with yourself and discovering your inner resources, you're talking about invisible things. And we are completely lost with gross physical entities, something that we can relate to, touch and feel. We, are, we have become a slave to the dictates of the five senses. Right? The world, every part, any part of the world you go, especially in the so-called developed countries, Everybody says, I'm busy. It is not important you are busy. Is it important? It's not important you are busy. So are the bees. They're also busy, right? <laughs> what is important is, what are you busy about? This is the issue, what are you busy about? We are primarily busy about acquiring things to gratify and satisfy the dictates of your senses. Senses, I'm saying, the five senses. Something handsome, beautiful to look at, something delicious to taste, something soft to touch, something melodious to listen to, something fragrant to smell to. This is, this is, it is because of this passion towards the five sensual objects. Business people clearly know your weakness. That's how this big mall sprang up.
So the more and more you follow the dictates of the senses, the more and more you will become slave to money, slave to external material things. I am not jealous of your enjoying sensual pleasures. What I'm saying is, if you are somebody who is really looking for more stable, long-lasting happiness, then you are going in the wrong direction. That's what I'm saying. I also want to enjoy a little bit here and there, you know. That's not the issue. That's not the problem. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to be cynical. What I'm saying is, the regular question that I ask everybody, you know, I'm going to ask this question again today. Do you all want happiness? Okay, the organizer should collect your signature. <laughs> you all said you want happiness. For how many days you want happiness? Forever, right? The greedy Buddhist people might say, for many lives to come, yeah? That's what we, we try to <laughs> do. So, so we want happiness. Not only happiness, we want happiness as long as possible. This is not something you learned from your religion, from your particular philosophy, or from scientific discoveries. You are born like that. You are born like that. This is important to recognize. This is important to recognize because your very wish to have happiness and very wish to have long-lasting happiness shows that you have the capacity to achieve that long-lasting happiness. That's why in Buddhism we say, we all have the Buddha nature. Buddha nature basically means the mind's potential. The mind has the potential to achieve the highest happiness. Remove all obstructive factors, negative emotions and things like that. But unfortunately, we don't pay attention to this potential and we get distracted to, as I said, to the dictates of the senses. And because of this, we personally face problems. Community is facing problem. Society is facing problem. The whole world is facing problem today. Right? When you chase the sensual objects, sensual objects means material objects. Material objects, by definition, is a physical object. Anything that is physical has limitation, <laughs> right? So how can you make unlimited progress from limited resources? I mean, look at the world resources of water, of forest, of minerals. They have limitation. So every country is saying we have to increase the GDP every year. How is it possible? from limited resources. We are going only to kill the, the external environment, which we are seeing now, right now. Look, go to any big city. Any big city, I'm saying. It's basically many high-rise buildings, but people, are, people don't have clean air to breathe, clean water to drink. Still, we play with the gadget and think we are intelligent human beings. You are not able to protect even the fundamental things that is needed for you, for your survival, clean water, clean air. This is a result of our unchecked greed. <laughs> right? I mean, when I say unchecked greed, you know, everybody, I want this, I want this. Okay, how much you want? Right? So therefore, it's not only talking about future lives and nirvana, enlightenment, just for this life which is not a dream, which we have already obtained, which we are living right now. This life must be a happy life, peaceful life. And that happiness and peace, reliable peace and happiness, which you all said you want, will not be there just by pursuing the sensual pleasures. That's what I'm saying. I want to say this. Right? So therefore, on the very first day, of course we are reading a short text, the three principal aspects of the path. And this text is a small text which the library has published. And uh, I, I realized that the root text is not distributed. So uh, 
the organizers will bring copies of this and you need to buy this, 150 rupees, 130 rupees, something like that. And this is, fortunately, I translated this. And this is teaching of His Holiness Dalai Lama on, on, the, on the root text. So, so I'm not here to sell the library books. That's not my primary <laughs> object, okay. <laughs> but, but, but we need to sell also, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the main object is, you know, we should make this gathering fruitful, meaningful. And you will not be able to remember everything that I say. I may not know everything. But this book, if you read slowly, carefully, you will then be able to know the meaning of this short text which is really like the summary of all the great teachings of the Buddha, all the great Buddhist teachers. So this is like a very, very important uh, thing that we should do. So therefore, I tomorrow will bring this book. You don't have to buy if you don't want, okay. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm saying is, I will try my best, and you should also try your best to make this short meetings meaningful and fruitful. It should affect our life. Because in the world, there's so much suffering, so much problem, and much, much of this problem is unnecessary problem. There, there are sufferings and problems which are created through natural disasters, fire, uh, tornado, uh, Tsunami, earthquake, many of this understandable. There's nothing much we can do. We can do something, of course, nothing much. But much of the problem that we are suffering today is, I say, unnecessary problem because these are created by human beings. The war that you are seeing, the conflict that you have seen in Ukraine and Russia, the conflict now about to flare out between Israel and Iran. Similarly, many other places. These are man-made problems. Therefore, unnecessary problem. Therefore, it is important for you to study Buddhist teachings also. Because according to Buddhist teaching, the Buddha says, you don't have to kill people, they will die. <laughs> you don't need this, you know, costly ballistic missiles and atom bombs. I mean, the extent of human craziness, you know, it's all rooted in ego, you know. I, me, mine, this demarcation, you see. So therefore, but through this kind of study and personal reflection, we should know and understand the sameness of all of us. Whichever religion you want to follow, follow, no problem. Your skin may be black or white or brown or yellow, no problem, because if you cut the skin, you'll see blood in each of us. All of us will feel the heart. <laughs> it's not that the white skin don't feel the heart or brown people feel the heart. It's not like that. We are same. Emotion also, we are same. And more importantly, if you look at the law of nature, Law of nature does not make dis discrimination. Law of nature does not segregate. If there is an earthquake, it will move all of us together. It will not say, I'll move only the Tibetans <laughs> and not others. <laughs> Especially, I'll move Geshe Lakdola, no. <laughs> it will move all of us. When the sun shines, it gives a light to all of us. It doesn't make discrimination. And who is making discrimination? Stupid human mind. Human mind itself is really great, as I said, Buddha nature is there, you have this amazing potential, but this potential, great human mind or brain, whatever you intellect, or whatever you want to call it, this great power that we have is misused. So we are here to properly use it to benefit others, not to misuse it. If you have mis misused it earlier, this is time to say, okay, I made a mistake, I'll change, I'll become better. Because my life is to make others happy, myself happy, and not to become a source of suffering and problem for others. Right? 
And this you can easily understand if you take yourself as an example. You want other people to say good things about you, do good things about you, compliment you, <laughs> right? So they, similarly, others also same like that. They also have same emotion, same yearning, same desire, right? So, so honestly speaking, we are really like a group of people traveling in a small ship in a turbulent sea. If you're a group of people, say 10, 20 people from 10, 20 different countries traveling together in a small ship in a turbulent sea, where is the room for fighting? Where is the room for quarreling? The sea is turbulent. We are all hoping not to die. So at that time, we'll all become good friends. Right? So we are living in this turbulent world, short life. We are not going to live more than 100 years. We have right now 8 billion human population. All this 8, human population, 8 billion human population are dead after 100 years counting from today. I'm not saying they will be killed by ballistic missiles or atom bombs. These things are not necessary. Even without all this, it's natural for us to die. So where is the need and the room for mistreating each other, exploiting each other, bringing suffering upon each other? If somebody says, okay, Geshila, this today is your last day, you're going to die tomorrow. If I have that realization, then will I be able to, will I, will I dare to do something bad to you today? No. Right? And then look at our physical structure, mental emotion structure. We are all vulnerable. We are all fragile. We are all susceptible, tender. So therefore we need to treat others very, very carefully. Yes, it's, sometimes you flare out, you, you get angry. Nobody gets enlightened one day. There's no push button enlightenment. That is true. But this does not mean to say that you develop strong hatred and make divisions, you see. So see others just like your children. Your children also, your naughty children also sometimes bother you, make you angry, do silly things. But still you will deal with them properly because deep down in your heart you have love for these children. So similarly all this not only according to Buddhism, it's not only human beings, but all sentient beings, are our children, our brothers, sisters, whatever. So you should have that love, that compassion, praying and wishing that they are without suffering, praying and wishing that they meet with happiness. That should be there. If you have such a mind, such a mental attitude, your mind will be filled with happiness. You may not be rich like Bill Gates or, I don't know, there are so many rich people, right? I mean, I'm not jealous again, but, <laughs> but you don't have to, you know, become rich or wealthy or something like that in order to, to be happy. I give this kind of small talks, you know, things all the time, so sometimes people think that, okay, Gishila is just talking. I, we, are, we are not sure whether he is happy or not. So sometimes people chase me, and they say, Gishila, are you really happy? I said, yes, I'm happy. Don't you live alone? Yes, I live alone. Are you still happy? Yes, I'm happy. <laughs> then they say, how, why, why, why are you happy? Have you not lost your country, Tibet? Yes, I've lost. Are you still happy? Yes, I'm happy. So many questions they ask. I say, I'm happy. Then at the end of the day, they say, what is, what is the source of your happiness? Source of my happiness may be a little bit from Buddhist study, but on a very ordinary level, I have a place to live. I have food to eat. I have a small room to sleep. I have many, many nice friends around me. Like today, I'm so happy with so many people, you know, listening to me. What else you want? 
and you always talk about at, 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 at least you try to talk about good things you know encourage other people and then some pe- some people do get benefit then you feel happy yes i was able to help one person right so therefore it is very important to be happy as you, as you said so now what is happiness happiness means mental satisfaction mental satisfaction will be there if you don't lead a life of duplicity if you say one thing do another thing there is a discrepancy there will be no deep satisfaction your appearance and reality doesn't match there will be no satisfaction but if you're honest practice what you preach don't harm others you are happy you have no enemy no enmity sometimes as i said sometimes you get angry pick up a small verbal fight okay then after that you said i'm sorry why why can't we say sorry i've been personally on a small level not big on a small level i've been trying to practice this sometimes i also get angry you know or at least like uh, uh, frustrated so sometimes you need that also for some people dealing with some people you need to a little bit tough i've been dealing with many people <laughs> but then deep down you know don't develop that enmity hatred and disliking to that person superficially on the surface sometimes you need really tough some people otherwise they don't understand any other language but deep down should feel sorry there so many different people for some people okay you get angry immediately after they said i'm very sorry let us go for a cup of tea that's it that person will understand there are others who whose nature is such they will keep on bothering you so there you need to be a little bit tough but deep down no enmity no hatred right this is very very important as i said we all have you know we are human beings ordinary human beings we have emotions attachment is there anger is there all these things are there but you you should not see these emotions as very important for you without which you can't live right then understand other people you know they they have they have, they may have their many problems so sometimes they express their problem in in front of you <laughs> so understand their little try to understand their background not whether you like it or not sometimes some people come without any reason very angry in my office also my basically i have a very nice job so there's no room for disagreement or fighting things like that i have a very good job but sometimes without any reason some people come a little bit angry so how should i deal with that i deal with them in many ways sometimes i tell them very politely when i see that person very angry i said i'm very sorry can you come later i'm very busy right now <laughs> which is not true i'm not busy <laughs> because i reacted very politely they leave then i say please come up to one hour they will never come back after one hour <laughs> because they will not remain angry for one hour nobody this, this is the good thing you see anger comes but nobody remains angry the whole day it goes out so sometimes instead of saying come up to one hour i tell them what can i do for you please sit down again depends you know some people yes tough some people yes please sit down then listen carefully what can i do it may be a very small issue misunderstanding due to whatever the reason so share that and then they they also feel happy and go so there are, there are many ways of dealing with it. people as i said people are like children you know we are we we say we are grown up i'm geshe or i'm phd or doctor or, you know but still we are we are we are like children the buddha calls us my sons my daughters my children he calls us my children because 
our biological age may be big, but mental maturity is not much, honestly. You may have PhD or whatever, but that, that doesn't relate to your mental regulation, emotional regulation. You, you study something else, <laughs> right? So maturity still is not there. Maturity means when your concern for others outweighs your concern for yourself, that is maturity. That's maturity. So that all these things take time, right? So therefore, it is important to always remember life is short. And uh, then depending upon your age, you know, there was, there was a, a Tibetan teacher who once instructed his student, are you studying and practicing Dharma? The student said, yes, sir, I'm practicing, I'm studying Dharma. He said, don't tell lie. I saw you sleeping the whole night and getting distracted the whole day. When, did you get, when do you get the time to do Dharma practice? Honestly speaking, there is not much time. How about our life? We sleep, of course. Then in between, food, you know, going here and there, then distraction, then mobile phone, and so many things. So time for practice is not much there. So it's good that you have a residential course here where you should pay more attention in developing these inner resources. That's important. Because once you know how to handle your mental emotions, <clears throat> in all ups and downs in your life, you will be able to sail fairly smoothly. And I have myself seen many people who when lacks or without having these inner resources, they feel very upset with the slight ups and downs in life. So all these problems, which I said is unnecessary problem, can be solved if you develop some of this positive attitude and develop some of these inner resources. Let me give you, for example, one example, how, how things, your, your mental attitude makes a big change. And let me give you an example. For example, let us say, my, my parents. As a student of Buddha's teaching, when I fully know that these are my parents of this life, but it's law of nature that they are going to die, when nobody knows, it may be tomorrow. In my case also, <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> Just this morning I heard about one Tibetan you know, who had worked in the library for some time. He was riding on a bike and had an accident and died. But there are many, many cases like that. If you watch your mobile phone, you know, the death is like this. <laughs> Hundreds and millions are dying right now. Birth also like that. Birth is a little bit more because of modern medicine. things. Anyway, so when you think like that, my parents or my friends, whoever, they are going to die, I'm going to die. When they are going to die, when I'm going to die, it's not sure. Therefore, right now, when we are living together, we must be nice to each other. Once I was giving a public talk in Russia, Moscow, about more or less the similar thing, because I keep on repeating the same thing. <laughs> because the, I mean, so I was giving a similar kind of talk, and then uh, I was telling them to be happy and things like that. So there was an elderly Russian lady sitting in the front line. She said, Geshe-la, I'm an old Russian lady living alone, nobody living with me and uh, I'm also not rich, so how can I be happy? I said, you can be happy. I, I, I'm sorry if you have problems, but, but I see that you have both the eyes intact. 
both hands intact, both the legs intact. The point that I'm making is, we have so many good things that we can be happy about. Imagine with your two eyes, you don't take it for granted how many hundreds and thousands of people who have lost their eyesight. How many people are there who have lost both the legs, both hands? I myself so many people. Right? So you're happy. You're, you're lucky. You have all this. So it's not enough to say that I have all this. Now, because you have all these facilities, use this eye. When you look at others, look with love and compassion. When you, when you find that you have both the hands intact, use this for hugging. Use this for shaking hand. You have this nice teeth, show it and smile, make others sunshine, you know. <laughs> Your sunshine smile, bring happiness in the mind of others. So many things you can do. And human beings have this amazing brain intelligence. And we hardly use this intelligence. We just, just follow the population, follow the mob. That's why democracy is also becoming mobocracy, right? So use this human intelligence. In the Buddhist teaching, the best way to become Buddha is understanding the law of nature, using your brain, using your intelligence, finding the truth. And don't just follow the appearance. Appearance is a deceptive. You will be cheated even in the mall and market if you just look after appearance. You will marry the wrong person if you just follow the appearance. Appearance is a deceptive, so therefore follow the reality by using your intelligence through logical you know, reasoning and things like that. So use this brain and see what is good for you, what is good for others, what is good temporarily, what is good in the long run for the whole world, things like that. Use it. And then similarly we have this amazing language and this language i believe is not only for communication this language is to have dialogue and negotiation and discussion when there is a problem not to use physical might unfortunately today wherever there is a problem immediately they flex their muscle and brandish the guns and ballistic missiles this is happening right now we should not do that when there is a problem especially much in advance when the problem is about to happen, then the leaders should immediately find the solution. A spark that is extinguished at the right time saves the forest fire, as we say, which is true. Now many of the problems that you are seeing today is because at the very initial stage, nobody bothered about it, that this will become a forest fire. And then at the end of the day, okay, you have you use all your 3,400 ballistic missiles, whatever, this side, that side, you kill, kill hundreds and thousands. Then what, what will you get? <laughs> what, what will you get? The very country for which you are supposed to be working, the very people for which you are supposed to be working, you end up destroying your own people, destroying your own nation because of your ego, short-sightedness. So at least according to the Buddhist teaching, the winner is one who wins over the negative emotions. The rest is killing dead bodies. This is what is exactly said in the Buddhist text. Lagma rola sebo. That means killing dead body, meaning that they are going to die, you don't have to kill, as I said earlier. So these are winners, real winners. Well, one who wins the heart of other people. One who changes, transforms the life of other people, which Buddha did, which Jesus did, which many great teachers did in the past. Now today, we claim we are followers of Jesus, we are followers of Buddha, we are followers of this and this teaching. We don't practice their, their teaching. Right? So therefore it is important to use this language. Whenever there is a problem, then you should say, okay, let us sit down and discuss and solve the problem through negotiation dialogue. We are not tigers and lions. 
if there is a conflict between tigers and lions, then the tiger can't say, oh, Mr. Lion, please sit down. Let us have a dialogue, a negotiation, <laughs> right? They can't say because they don't have that sophisticated language. <laughs> the only thing they can do is pounce upon each other and tear, try to tear each other apart. So we are doing like the animals. Animals, and especially if you are called a lion, then you feel very happy, you know. You are very brave, but still you are an animal. Even, even if you are called a lion, still people are saying you are an animal. <laughs> right? So therefore, I, I really constantly these days feel, we need to discover, who am I? Who is a human being in the true sense of the term? Are we fulfilling the meaning of that human life? If you just, just study your physical structure, your eye, your hand, your nails, and everything, if you study in detail, you will find there that we are basically, you know, uh, more towards nonviolence, not towards violence. We don't have a teeth like that of a tiger or a lion. We can't kill others with teeth. We don't have a nail, you know, like, like a hawk or eagle. If we try to kill others with our nail, all your nails will fall out. Then, then, then why all these bad things are happening? So physically, you are nonviolent. But the problem is because you have misused your mind. Like using the nuclear energy to kill people. Nuclear energy itself is a potential, neither good nor bad. You can use it for, you know, light, for energy, and you can also make an atom bomb to kill others. So we are misusing our human intelligence. So what we are doing here today is to properly use this human mind and move towards the path shown by the Buddha. Now in this regard, I'm not saying you should become a Buddhist. It's up to you. I'm not here to convert you, you know. That's not, not the issue. Follow any religion you want. It's like family members sitting together on a dining table. The wife might like rice, the husband might like you know, bread, children might like soup. So they should not be fighting over this. The father should not say, because I like bread, all of you should, should eat bread. Otherwise, I'll beat you. I mean, if you, the family member says something like this, is like ludicrous. So similarly, spiritual practices are mental food. Depending upon your interest, your disposition, your inclination, your family background, whichever religion you follow, that's not the issue. There's no problem. The problem is don't consider religion more important than human beings. Religion is also a way and a means to serve human beings and sentient beings all around. Sometimes, I'm, I'm emphasizing on this point because sometimes we have this tendency of using the religion and then in the name of religion you don't hesitate killing others, which for me is as the greatest stupidity. Because the so-called God or Buddha, have you met God? Or to be honest, have you met Buddha? How much knowledge do you have about them? Maybe you read some of Buddha's teachings, some of the teachings that you see in the Quran or in the Bible, right? So your job is to follow those wonderful teachings, not to kill other people in the name of that invisible force, right? The God, as I said, you have not seen. Buddha, you have not seen. But these people are sitting in front of you. They're breathing. They're alive. How can you have no feeling towards these people and then pretend you have great feeling for the, the, those higher up. The higher ups don't need any defensive, defending you know, method. If they are omniscient, they are all powerful, they can defend themselves. You don't have to 
kill for them. <laughs> you have to defend these people. They are vulnerable. They are fragile. They have problems, difficulties. Right? So fighting in the name of religion is the worst thing. It's like medicine becoming poison. Right? So therefore, so, uh, yeah, so therefore, in this, on this first day, I really want to uh, give the message that we should, number one, feel happy that I'm born as a human being where you can do so many great things. If you're born as a dog or a cow, there's not, nothing much they can do. It's so clear to us. So we should not be acting like animals. I mean, in some cases, animals are better than us. <laughs> right? So since we have this great mental power and physical facilities, we should use this to make your life happy and others' life also happy. And don't, don't, <clears throat> don't develop this stupid, you know, mind of dividing people, segregating people. The Buddha said, there is no way you can please me. Accepting, pleasing, Sentient beings. If you please sentient beings, if you please human beings, then you are pleasing me. If you mistreat these people, these sentient beings, then bow before me and make some offerings. He said, this is duplicity. This is not true religious practice. True religious practice is not going around the temple, not making prostrations. It is changing your mind, transforming your mind. Because it is your mind which will bring long-lasting happiness or which will also bring long-lasting suffering. It is your mind, not your body. So therefore it is important to take good care of your mind more than you take care of your body. For body we do take some care. These days people just pop in so many types of vitamins, they do some exercise and jogging and yoga and <laughs> meditation. Meditation may be for mind. All those things you do, but for the mind, there's nothing much we do. So when I say transform and change the mind, I'm not saying become a Buddhist. Or be, make this very clear. I'm saying, yes, you can follow the Buddha's teaching, you can follow others' teaching also, and then you... you you know, take the best out of those teachings. Many people ask the question, you know, which religion is best? This is a stupid question. This is like asking which medicine is best. You cannot pick up one medicine and say this is best. This is more costly, therefore this is best. If you have diarrhea, you cannot pick up a medicine for headache and say this is the best. <laughs> so, so that medicine which, is, which cures your personal illness is best for you, but that doesn't mean that medicine is best for others who are having different physical problems. So you cannot say this particular medicine is best. So similarly, religion also, depending upon your mental disposition, one particular religion may be more suitable to you, the others may not be suitable to you, but this does not mean it is irrelevant to others. So therefore, respect every religion. Every philosophy, right? So therefore, in our daily life, what is important is develop a proper motivation Every day, right in the morning, you develop a proper motivation that I will make this day meaningful. Meaningful means 
not only sitting in a corner and you know doing some practice not because you can't do that all the time you have to do your work for your food clothing so forth so whatever you're doing whatever your job whatever your profession try to get at least 5 10 minutes in the morning as soon as you get out from the bed don't just jump to switch on the tv tv and see what is happening between israel and iran which i'm also tempted to see unfortunately so the first thing that you should do is with a feeling of bliss and happiness you should think that it's wonderful that i'm able to wake up again as a human being and able to live another day there there's no guarantee so appreciate that it's wonderful now particularly at this particular time the weather is so wonderful here right you are not sick you are able to attend the teaching so appreciate all this good things that you have and then you should say that i will make this day meaningful make that <coughs> promise this is like charging the battery the purpose of charging the battery is not to use it when there is a broad daylight but to use it when there is darkness in the night when there is no proper light then you use that charged flashlight or torch so similarly having developed this motivation as charging the battery <clears throat> then at the close of the day before you go to sleep review the day's experience and see whether you managed to live in accordance with the promise that you made in the morning if you find that you are successful in fulfilling your promise then be happy and go to sleep very peacefully i made my you know day meaningful i help this person that person in my case also i do this number of people come to see me then i talk to them and sometimes my you know uh, words benefit them a little bit sometimes it may be just guiding them what to read there are many ways of helping people which they may not have access i may have the access so i say okay read this book that book things like that just as i was saying this read this book <laughs> so then i feel feel happy yes i was able to help right so in this way you make your by meaningful and then if you find that you could not fulfill your promise that you made in the day then you should regret yes i could not live up to my promise up to my motivation but tomorrow i will improve tomorrow i will improve don't lose this determination tomorrow i will live so like that you have to repeatedly do it just just like for the body you know you have to eat every day three four times a day so for for the mental spiritual food also you need to do this reflection and meditation whatever you call it three four times a day nourish it right then gradually you will see the benefit you will see the change that is the way and then even when you go to sleep even you find that you lived a meaningful life your promise was successful but that's not the end of the story when you just before you go to bed close your eye think something about something positive maybe recite remember try to remember one very impactful verse of shanti deva or buddha or nagarjuna and see whether you know the meaning of that teaching or not so while thinking like that then you fall asleep sometimes it is interesting that it may be worse that you could not really figure out the meaning but in the night with this motivation when you sleep sometimes you are able to get the meaning during the sleep because during the sleep time the mind is very clear because you have withdrawn all your senses all your senses are not functioning you are more or less dead then the mind gets the opportunity 
to really wake up and become very clear. You may be physically sleeping here in Dharamsala. Mentally, you may be shopping in New York. Right? So this shows the mind's capacity to become stronger, more energetic, when you don't give too much credit to the physical demands. Right? So in this way, 24 hours you are practicing. In the day, in the night also. Contrarily, just before you close your eye, if you watch a horror movie <laughs> or something else, you might replay the scene in the dream also. This is how you end up filing the negative you know, activities. Right? So therefore, to make a long story short, what I'm saying is, in your day-to-day -day -day life, appreciate the fact that you are born as a human being. And then make a determination that I will use this human life meaningful. Meaningful means as much as possible help others. As much as possible don't harm others. That is making your life meaningful. It's not so much about how many mantras you chant, how many prayers you chant. Okay, you, you, you can chant the mantra, all those things, but the, the main thing is how much you're helping others how much you are refraining from yourself, harming others, how much you are taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself is very, very important now because you have started thinking about helping others. You are now important. As, as Martin Luther King said, you can all, this is how he said, you can all become great because you can all help. <laughs> this is what Martin Luther King said, you know. To become great doesn't mean you become a president or prime minister or billionaire or millionaire. Great actually means whether people give you the recognition or not. Great person is somebody who knows how to bend down and help others. He's a great person. We can all become great because we can all help. Right? So that is, that is the key. I mean, we can keep on talking, talking. You know, sometimes we are so carried by word and sentences and texts. We read hundred different texts. At the end of the, end, at the end of the day, you have nothing to practice. That should not be there. As I always have been saying, that if you are thirsty, you need to drink water, not necessarily the whole ocean. No need. <laughs> Understand some of the some of the basic things. Basic human kind of ways of doing things. Smile, help others, say nice words, and don't harm others. Don't develop negative emotion to manipulate others. These days, unfortunately, when, when it comes to the money, people are ready to cheat anybody. Very, 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 very unfortunate. I mean, in politics, you know, we all see People, people don't even hesitate telling lie after lie. Brazen lie. Very shameful, very unfortunate. There is no decency. There is no human you know, feeling and morality, you see. And how can you have a strong, successful country when nobody can trust anybody? How? Right? So unfortunately, these things are happening in many countries. But we should not become, we should not collude with those things, right? Whatever, is, whatever, whatever other people are doing, at least in your case. You know, some people, some people, sometimes people ask me, you know, this is what is happening in the society, so Gisela, how can I do this? I said, okay, if all people are jumping from the ninth floor and committing suicide, will you also commit suicide? You should, you should be different. When the whole situation is difficult, then you, your need is much more than before. If everybody is perfect, then even if there's no Buddha, it's okay. We have problems, we have difficulties, we have misunderstandings. Therefore, we need people who help, who encourage. Generally, generally speaking, majority of the people I, th I consider very good people. It is not that people are, you know, hopeless and nothing can be done. I mean, there is ignorance, there is difficulty, there is misunderstanding, but at the core, they are all basically good people. Everywhere you go. Ordinary people, I'm saying. 
They want to just have a nice family, help each other, earn their daily bread. That's all. If you go to a big city like New Delhi, which has allowed 20 million or something like that, how many people get killed in a day? Maybe countable, few. But how many people are being taken care of in the families, in the hospitals? Millions are taking care. So this actually means love is much more predominant, much more stronger. But sometimes what we see in the media, newspapers, is the bad things, not the good ones. So therefore, sometimes we might get the impression that we are hopeless. So we should try to highlight those good things also. It's very, very important. Right? Not only... <laughs> Not only cricket and Bollywood and Hollywood, <laughs> singing, dancing, you know, not only that, but, but talk about morality, talk about, you know, tell the story of somebody who helped somebody, who saved the life of somebody. Those things must be there, you see. So these are not much discussed, unfortunately, but we can't blame anybody. We should play our own role, right? Okay, I've said a lot of things. No questions. Again, when I say questions, I'm not saying I have all the answers. But we should ask the questions. Then I'll try to answer whatever I know. Otherwise, we should all find out the answer. So discussion and dialogue is more important than just my continuously saying things. Okay. Don't worry about the text. Text is very short, very easy to finish. <laughs> it's profound, but will take some time. But so I think it is better that we talk about something that makes sense in today's world. And many people, in fact, I have been saying Buddhism must make sense in today's world. It's not just citing difficult quotations, you know, and then telling people, okay, you should develop faith towards that. I'm not interested in those things. I want to, as much as possible, share the core Buddhist ideas in a more plain, understandable language. Yes, madam. Yes. Anji. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. Wait, please, until the microphone is with you, then ask the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about karma. Are you going to talk about this? Yeah. Because, um, you know, sometimes it... Well, I was going to say about the animals. The animals, for me, feel more conscious than us with our minds because our minds are, so, are just too powerful. And, uh, you know... We can see that, the, the, the bad things in the world. The animals aren't creating any pollution, any hatred. They, they're animalistic. And for me, it seems more pure than being a human, in fact. So I want to know how... Yeah, I, mean, I think you've already said it, but I, I just feel now, by looking at many animals, butterflies, any living form that it's actually more conscious than us. I see the love in them with each other than I see in us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. More conscious than human beings, I don't know. But they are more natural. They are more in tune with the nature. And, I mean, I can't lump all the animals together because they are different degrees like like the different types. Some of them are much more sensitive, some of them are less sensitive. But generally speaking, uh, as I already mentioned, animals are more natural. They live in accordance with the nature. They are less sensitive than us. So therefore, they would not immediately react with anger and jealousy, hatred, and those things are not there. And among people also, people there are people who are, like, who are not so so-called educated, the villagers. They are less sensitive. They live in nature, you know. 
they, they, they dig the ground, they live with the animals, uh, they really toil, you know. So therefore they, they become more tolerant to many things. They are not, not so, you know, uh, irrational and sensitive like the, the so-called educated people. Because, because <laughs> in addition to the, the given human brain and intelligence, the so-called education that we get today, I'm, I, I'm not so sure what kind of education we are getting today. The education that we are getting today is literacy, reading, writing, mathematics, then getting this piece of paper, BA, MA, and getting a job. And when you get a job also, you are more, more or less similar like the computer. The computer is looking towards you. You are looking towards the computer. Okay? And you are also trained in the so-called educated in such a way that you also become similar like another computer part. Whichever part, you know, of the world, a computer part is needed. They are, they are same part, so you can easily supply and make it useful. Similarly, people are also trained in the same way and supply in different parts of the world to do the same job. So there's no real exploration of the, this human creativity. You know, th things like those are not there. So therefore, the reason that we need to reflect on these issues is that the education must be for human flourishing, not just for literacy human happiness, human harmony. That's more important. If you go to big cities, people helping each other is you know, much more in, among villagers than among rich people. Rich people, they, at, the most, at the most, they'll throw some money. Then she send you to hospital, you know. <laughs> There's no genuine affection and love, a human feeling, you know, those things are becoming more and more rare. <laughs> so in that sense, you're right. Animals are better in that sense. I remember his soul in this Dalai Lama once saying that if you see earthworm, you know, moving in front of you, his soul in said, in a way, I feel like paying homage to the earthworm. Because this earthworm looks very fragile and helpless, but it's not harming anybody. And in fact, in some places like America, they are using earthworm to produce this very fertile soil, you know, with its limited capacity, it's contributing. So in our case, I mean, I'm not saying that we are just a bunch of bad people, there are good things also, but uh, because bad things are more bothering us, trouble us, so therefore we talk about the bad things that we are doing. So, so we, we need to change the course of our life to learn how to live harmoniously and happily. Okay, yeah. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your teachings. Mm -hmm. So basically my question is like, uh, okay, being born in India, so we are connected with our families a lot. Yeah. Okay, so for instance, like, I like being single and like staying alone and basically trying to spread happiness to the world. Yeah. But our families, in a way, I feel like they want us to marry and get, you know, bounded and, uh, yeah, like basically start a family. And in a way, they pressure us also. Like, they are, I understand them also. But yeah, it's a contradiction with the family and us and our thinking. So yeah, it keeps on ringing my head a lot. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, this is a problem I'm very familiar with. <laughs> because many, many of my Indian friends, some of them very close friends, they also have the same problem. I should not share this joke here, okay. <laughs> I'll share this separately to the Indian group <laughs> in Hindi. Okay. So I'm joking. But this is not important. So, so yeah, this, this is true. But you see, it's, it's a family tradition, you know. People normally do what their tradition says. They hardly think. 
So therefore, the parents think that it is their responsibility to have their you know, son and daughter married. And then they say, okay, now they're married, I've done my job, you know. So they, they, are, they are thinking about their own personal responsibility. So there, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But in your case also, you have every right to decide what you really want to do, right? So, so you should find the middle way. Not, not to make them angry. You, of course, take good care of them, keep in touch with them, and then gently share that this way I will be able to help you also much better. If you get married, then you will go with the wife. <laughs> ah. There is this famous saying that when you get, get a new wife, you forget your mother, you know. <laughs> it's a Tibetan saying. That means you get the bride and forget the mother. This is a tendency there. So the parents should also be happy that you are continuously in touch with them, you know. And then in, 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 in India has such a big population. You know, if, it is, if you are a Tibetan, I would also recommend Mary, please. <laughs> Because, because we are, we are, I should not be saying things like that as a monk, but, <laughs> but I, 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 I think there's not much problem because, because in the case of Tibetans, we are such a small population, you know. We are controlled by China, and then in exile we have only uh, 150,000 only. Now half of it is already moved to America and Europe, so in India, maybe. 80,000, 80, something like that, not much more. And then many people, because of economical reasons, don't like to get married, or even if married, not more than one or two children. So the population has a, become a big issue for us. So in that case, it's different. But in your case, India has such a big population, you see. So it's not important to, to marry in that sense. The important thing is, as you mentioned, the reason that the monks and nuns, the reason that they become monk and nun is so that they don't have to worry too much about their family problems, small problems. Think bigger and do more greater things for others. That is the reason why people become monks and nuns. So whether you call yourself monk or not, you are basically lead a single life. It's really like a monk. So you can do more, you know, philanthropy or, you know, other beneficial activities, including your parents. But but you need to explain that properly, without angering them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here is also there. Yeah. Okay. Hello, sir. I can't see. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Actually, I visited so many countries, not many uh, uh, little countries for, who follows Buddhism and uh, like Thailand, like China. And uh, I also belong to such a place where the Tibetans are so many in population, like uh, I am from Dehradun. And I saw there are so many people from yeah. the Tibetans or the Buddhists who ate uh, non veg Yes. Uh, okay, and uh, then the perception from my side and my family and my uh, relative and friend side that uh, why they are, why they people are eating so much non veg <laughs> uh, because of <laughs> it's not a teaching by the Buddhism, and uh, Buddhism says no killing, and. Uh, when I visit the countries like Thailand, everyone is saying that he is following the Buddhism and he eat uh, non veg a lot in China also. So this is my question, yeah. that why there is so much eating of non veg and what, is, what about the teaching of Buddha yeah. of non-killing? Thank you. Yeah, you are focusing only on meat. But unfortunately, what we are supposed to practice and what we are not practicing, that is there in many areas. The many things we do, not only the Buddhists, but can you say all the Christians are practicing whatever is taught by the Jesus? Can you say the Muslims are practicing everything that uh, Muhammad has taught? 
this is a problem with all of us, not being able to practice uh, what we are taught to do. It's not just meat. Now, with regard to meat, if you visit countries like Tibet or, or some countries, some republics in Russia, Tuva, Kalmukia, Buretia, Mongolia, these are all cold areas, very cold areas, Siberia. So hardly any vegetation. So therefore they live with animals, unfortunately they also kill them, eat them, they depend on dairy products. So those are the stories. So those stories, you know, those habits continued in many places. So Tibetans also, I think, they are continuing that die-hard habit. I'm not saying this is good, I'm not trying to defend it, but we are continuing this die-hard habit. Now you can easily argue this by saying, okay, in Tibet it's different, now in India you, are, you have vegetables. But then I say, it's die-hard habit, continuously. But, but the good news is, things are changing much. Like in Dharamsala, in Meglorganj, there was not a single vegetarian hotel in the beginning. They're all non-vegetarian. Now you'll find many vegetarian hotels. I mean, run by Tibetans, not, not only Indians. So things are changing. It takes time. Things are changing. Then according to the Buddha's own teaching, he, he suggested that if you are sure that that meat that you are eating is the meat of an animal that is specially killed for you, whether you have seen it or heard about it or you have doubt, then you should not eat it. But otherwise, if it is found somewhere, you know, for example, if I travel from here to Delhi or somebody, obviously those meats are not killed for me. It's already there, liveless, like any, any like grain, right? So no problem if you, if you can eat it. That's the suggestion. Then if you, it depends on the situation. Then if you read this text called Lanka Avatar Sutra, descending into the Lanka Sutra, which is a sutra taught by the Buddha, said to have taught in Sri Lanka. And he said in those days there, there were cannibals there eating human flesh. So there the Buddha very strictly forbade eating any kind of meat. So it depends on the situation. Then there are other occasions where you said because of your habit and other you know, physical situations, for example, if you're very sick and doctor recommends that you need to eat a little bit meat, you can eat it. So, so Buddhism is basically a little bit like uh, relaxed teaching. No, not just no to everything, not like that. It depends on the context. But at the same time, now to, to again conclude, it is always better not to eat meat. We should not you know, defend eating meat because you might directly, indirectly harm others. And also, scientifically also, it is said that you need meat when you are young, but not when you are grown up. And now there are so many like uh, proteins that you can get from other you know, lentils or vegetables instead of meat. And then meat eating is also said to be very bad for the, for the environment, you see? So, so scientifically also not, not good. So therefore we should, if possible, completely stop it. If not possible, lessen it. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi. Yeah. So I want to touch down on one of the points that you mentioned while answering the, the lady out there, yeah. that uh, the life in village versus city is very different. Villages are, you know, in tune with nature, whereas city folks, they would just, you know, pay you the money and, hey, go to the hospital, heal yourself. Yeah. So I guess my question is, how do you be, you, how do you practice your sadhana or be mindful in a chaotic city like Delhi, what, what would be your approach to do that? Because I feel it's very, it comes naturally to you when you are in a place like this to do your meditation, but how do you do it when you, you know, go back home? Practice, practice, practice. 
This is the answer. Because, because you know, in, in, the, in the Buddhist process of practice, we recommend three process of practice. Listening, thinking, meditation. Right now you're listening. Right? So this should not be the end of the story. After having listened to today's talks and teachings and discussions, now you should again, later on, reflect on it, think about it, because you also have a very smart brain. And then through thinking, if you're able to develop the conviction, yes, what the teacher said sounds true, what the books says sounds true, then you will be able to develop the conviction because you thought about it. It's not just listening, but you thought about it, you scrutinized, scrutinized it, and you, you, you are able to confirm that this seems to be true. Then you develop the conviction, yes, this is true. Now, even when you have developed the conviction, the third, on the third level, what you need to do is now get habituated with it. Practice, practice, practice. We call it meditation. Meditation means getting completely habituated with the good ways of life. The virtuous practice. Meditation is not sitting in a corner, closing your eye. You know, meditation is not just temporarily feel good practice. It is to make your mind completely habituated with the good ways of life, your practices. The reason is you are controlled by your negative emotions right now. Negative emotions produce suffering. You don't want suffering. Therefore, now you are saying, I want to make my mind habituated with the good ways of life. So there you need to do repeated practice. You need to become an Olympian. People who, <laughs> the Olympians, they, they can't reach that level just by doing few sprints. They, they have to do it, do it repeatedly. Then you can see the result. This morning I was reading something, you know, the, the, a quotation, that quotation says, it's funny. You know, people, for example, when they you know, smoke or take hashish, something like that, when they do that, they know it is harming you, but still they will do it. Contrarily, if somebody teaches you that you do it, this is going to give you happiness and peace, they will not do it. <laughs> Why? Because we are addicted to the sensual objects. We have this animal instinct in us. So therefore, in order to change that, you need to Repeatedly do it. The more and more you see the reason, the more and more you see how destructive, for example, anger is, how destructive attachment is, the more and more you see these negative emotions as real poisons, then you will distance yourself from them. So therefore, there is no push button enlightenment. There is no quick fix solution, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Sheila, yeah. I have questions uh, regarding uh, you said who who I am. Yeah. So um, uh, before come here, I was thinking, well, people can't label the person. This person is a, is a, is a, is a Chinese, the Tibetan, or this yeah. is Buddhist yeah. or yoga. Yeah. And and then when the Buddhist comes and there's a a concept there's no i the, the i is just concept and then when when we <laughs> say who who i am is is like well there's no eyes and so there's a, just a concept so it can be like everything uh but eventually the long the, 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 the more it gets then the question is like uh if i want who i really am what should i do what should i practice in order to get the the, the fundamental core of of this um no, no, Buddhists, Buddhists never say there is no I. This is misunderstanding. The Buddhists never say you are not there. <laughs> you are very much there. The Buddhists say I is there, but I that you think is not there. <laughs> yeah. 
because normally when we we'll discuss this on the third principle aspect we'll discuss on this uh, much more in detail but as a precursor to that talk you know what we say is as i said earlier appearance and reality are different there is a discrepancy between appearance and reality appearance is a deceptive this is not only said in buddhism but the brain scientists also say that what your brain tells you is not necessarily the whole information it's optical illusion right so therefore buddhism also we don't say i is not there i is there but there is no i which you thought it is there because you thought you you didn't just think about a conventional i a nominal i but you thought an i existing independently inherently from its own right a permanent i not going to die you know this is what you in your ordinary unquestioning you know life you, you tend to see i'm going to live even if you ask this question to to a to a elderly person say 90 years old ask this question are you going to die he will say yes i'm going to die are you going to die today maybe not <laughs> so tomorrow also he will say the same thing the next day also he will say the same thing so that means deep down he is thinking i'm going to live i'm permanent kind of kind of permanent you see that that's how you know innately we you know think about things not only with i but anything we tend to see them something that you fancy you tend to see them 100% good when you like somebody you don't only see that object as good but you tend to see it as 100% good wow then the problem is then you get obsessed with it you get attachment and get stuck with that and when you don't like something you don't only see that thing negative but you'll see horrible this is a horrible hundred percent ugly hundred percent negative i cannot have negotiation i cannot have dialogue this enemy is devil personified <laughs> so this is exaggeration so therefore the middle way is taught in buddhism don't follow nihilism where you say things don't exist i don't exist no i exist things exist but if you say things exist independently exist forever that's exaggeration that's another extreme don't follow it follow the middle way okay yeah okay hi thank mm. you for your talk um in buddhism helping others is a core tenant and you were talking about this and um and i find a lot of the worst things in the world are done for the sake of helping others right so hitler was trying to make the world a better place uh, all the wars are typically fought for because people want to make a big impact in helping others right usually when you start to exploit resources you want to become president because you don't want to just help this like one person or your mother right you want to help everybody right and i'm personally very kind of conflicted between this it almost feels like i can be more human and more helpful if i'm more selfish if i'm more like okay i don't need to become big right and if i want to help everybody then i need to become big i need to help the world right all the christian wars were fought not to save god but to save the souls that were not you know on the path to christ so it was for their sake so i wonder what yeah what you think about that yeah it's questionable you know people who become president prime minister or others who say i want to help other people it's questionable whether they really want to help them or not whether they are helping themselves or helping others i don't know so in the true sense of the term when we talk about helping others it we are talking about genuine help without selfishness without hankering after personal power things like that i mean there's nothing wrong in thinking that in order to help others i need power 
if it is pure, purely for other people. But this is very difficult. It gets alloyed. You may say this is for others, but deep down it's for you. Because we see so many people who, who people are revolting, don't like them to continue there as a president and a prime minister. Still they are hanging on to that, even killing their people. You know? That clearly shows they are not there for helping other people. They are primarily for themselves, right? So therefore, this is not an easy kind of thing. So one, as I mentioned earlier, there should not be duplicity in what one says. It, helping others means like, like water helping you, the four elements helping you, the sunshine helped you, water helped you, but they did not ask anything back. So something like that's not easy. That's not easy, we are ordinary people. But uh, what I'm saying is we should have the best motivation in helping others without personal agenda. The clearest example I can give is uh, mothers, uh, good mothers, again, mother also, di different mothers. <laughs> good mothers love for our little innocent child. A good mother, genuinely good mothers love for our innocent child is that she really wants to help the little child, not expecting anything back. And she will feel happy if she is doing good, you know, growing up, healthy. Apart from that, she doesn't want anything. So that is not easy to find. Not easy, yeah. But, but having said that, in order to help others also, you need power, yes. But you should not get obsessed with the power. That's the problem. Many leaders in the beginning, for example, Mao Zedong, in the beginning, probably he also really wanted to help the peasants, the farmers. And then he did all this revolution. But then he finally when he became the chairman, he, he, he was drunk by the power and mercilessly tortured and oppressed and killed people. Right? So there's the thing. It's complex, yes. Okay. Yeah. Here. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the, about conflicts. Yeah. So Buddhism is yeah, about helping others, and this is very good and very um, good for the world. Yeah. Yes. So, what happens if there's a conflict? Like maybe a small conflict um, that if I won't skip in line, I may be gonna late for something is really important. And what about a big conflict that can be also realistic? Like um, if I eat that, I live, and if you eat that, you live, but I die. So it sounds maybe unrealistic, but it can happen sometimes. So what Buddhism says about that, if it's me or the other? I'm not sure whether I understood your question correctly, but uh, <coughs> it depends. What depends upon what what level is your practice? If your level of practice is very high, then you even sacrifice yourself for others. You let others gain victory. That level, of course, is not easily, you know, reached by everybody. Right. So therefore as much as possible, as much as possible, respect and regard others more than yourself. But that does not mean to say that you give an upper hand to even the wrongdoers. Wrongdoers. When you confront the wrongdoers, nasty people, then you have every right to oppose that person, challenge that wrongdoing. Therefore, in the Buddhist teaching, it says, make a distinction between the wrongdoer and the wrongdoing. Wrongdoing must be criticized, must be opposed very strongly, but the wrongdoer still should be given the opportunity to remain in the mainstream of the community. That person should not be ostracized. I think this is a very valid teaching, irrespective of however we are able to practice it. This is very important teaching because, as you can see, when we categorize some people as funda fundamentalist, uh, fanatics, or terrorists, and ostracize them, 
then these people also become you know black sheep among the society they feel hopeless that we are outside the society now we will definitely take advantage of everything we will we'll terrorize people you know they're also there so there should be a way to to it's not easy i'm not saying it is not e- i'm not saying it is easy but there should be a way not to ostracize people not to os- they will, on a larger scale not to ost- ost- ostracize any country any particular country this country is the worst country you know use ballistic missiles atom bombs eliminate that i don't think that is the solution okay no questions yes um, is it really important to be happy to live a content life because i see happiness is also a form of attachment or the the natural state of mind is to be happy and uh, how does going for sensory pleasures is taking it away from the natural state as i said i'm not against you enjoying a little bit you know having a uh tasting a nice delicious chocolate i also taste that <laughs> i'm not against that what what i'm against i'm not against but what i'm saying is the question that i asked do you want long lasting happiness or ephemeral pleasure if you if you if you say i'm okay with the pleasure i don't want happiness then it's your choice right but then we all all clearly can see that just by going too much out of this sensual pleasures and especially when you get get addicted to this sensual pleasures you become completely paralyzed and lost into it some years back we had a conference in uh, his holiness's office and uh, there was this uh, lady i don't remember her name she she was the director of this big addiction center in washington dc she said living in it is natural state the human body especially human brain has the capacity to protect the human being to a great extent when when left in its natural state this is a very important point when left in its natural state this is we don't leave our body and brain in its natural state so left in its natural state the body and the brain has very strong immune system healing power but when the brain gets addicted and the natural brain which has the capacity to protect you gradually that power of the natural brain is seized by that addicted part of the brain and your life becomes paralyzed for example if i take one puff of smoke i will immediately cough or if you go into a very dusty area you will cough or sneeze because the body is saying be careful protect yourself cover your mouth cover your nose you, you don't just need covid-19 bacteria to tell you this it has been there for <laughs> since time immemorial but we don't pay attention to these things what the body is saying what the body is in need right and then you again continue to take few more puffs again it will again you will you will cough the brain is saying be careful this is not good for you this is not good for you but as stupid as you are you continue to take more and more puffs and then gradually you will not you will stop coughing temporarily because now the natural brain has said okay if you want to commit suicide go ahead i've told you a few times now if you this is what you want okay go ahead then the addicted part of the brain takes over and the addicted part of the brain says bring more cigarette bring more cigarette then you get addicted to cigarette so much so later on without taking you know without smoking a day you will immediately feel restless i've seen people like this 
they are trembling, shaking, you know. This is just one example. You, get, you can get addicted to so many things. Maybe coffee, maybe tea, maybe, you know, uh, you know uh, improper sleep, whatever. So many things we get, get, get addicted. So that is not, of course, good for your health. So therefore, this is, I'm advising people, if you are fond of sweet, yes, you can take sweet, but please take very less. If you take less sweet today, or less chocolate today, you can continue to take chocolate and sweet for the rest of your life. If you say, I like chocolate too much, and then keep on eating chocolate, very soon you will suffer from? Huh? From what? Diabetes. Then you, the doctor will say, okay, you can't take any sweet. So therefore, moderation right from the beginning, before you get sick. A little bit enjoyment, okay, but don't get addicted. This will destroy your long-lasting happiness. This will destroy your stability, you see, right? So many examples are there. People who are addicted to power, you know, people who are addicted to money, you know. For the first few years, they get this money and they get, you know, two, three nice cars, they roll around and think they're walking in heaven, you know. <coughs> then very soon they get into problem. I have so many examples. You have so many examples. So take those examples and learn from that real life. So it's important to have moderation in life. <laughs> okay. Yes, here. Uh, please. Uh, so I want to ask about this kind of happiness that you also said it's like we need we, we are satisf satisfying our mind which means happiness and I was recently speaking with one person and he said that uh, that we help others to or we o we always firstly or primarily make ourselves happy by helping the others so helping the others like satisfies us but isn't this like kind of selfish thing that is kind of like feeding our ego because yeah, we are yeah. also yeah, yeah. have these expectations that yeah, yeah. we have a we, we love somebody so we help yeah, the yeah. person yeah, yeah. but we expect he's going to be happy and that will make ourselves happy yeah yeah this is this is this question is related to his question also which i thing I did not answer, the second part of his previous question, <laughs> I did not answer. So yes, selfishness is there. But there are two types of selfishness. Stupid way of being selfish and wise way of being selfish. <laughs> so this is, this is not, you are not trying to harm others. You have every right to be happy, right? And you are, you are trying to achieve that happiness not at the cost of harming others. That is a wise way of being selfish. Helping others, you will also get happiness. That is also a little bit of selfishness. But it's the wise way of being selfish. But if you completely ignore the needs of others to fulfill your ego, that is a stupid way of being selfish. So therefore we must make this distinction. There's nothing wrong that you aspire happiness, so long as you don't try to achieve it at the cost of harming others. There. Uh, Kishikla, so uh, we are talking about helping others, mm. but uh, what I have observed that sometimes we uh, so much want to help others, mm. we don't uh, understand that if they need it, or if it is right for them, or actually it is right for us, because uh, if we ask a person, if you, if you want to help somebody, we think in a way uh, that is helpful to them. So it is uh, based on our definition of help. Yes. So how do we uh, differentiate between actual help or the way we just want to help others, even if it is not right yes. or if they don't need it? Yes, that's why we need to study more, reflect more. In the, in the Buddhist text, it is clearly explained, of course, helping is important. Giving is important. Then the text says, but you need to know when to help, when not to help, what to give, what not to give. For example, 
Buddhist teaching says, give, practice charity. But that doesn't mean you give on giving, you know, keep on giving poison and uh, guns, ballistic missiles to <laughs> others. That's also giving, but not giving in the proper sense of the term, right? So you need to know when to help, when not to help. And uh, th that's why, that's un th this is another reason why we want to become Buddha. It's only when you become Buddha and become omniscient, then you will know everything in detail. Who needs what kind of help, you know? What is their past life's karmic predisposition? How this is going to help them in their future life? You'll be able to read their mind. But ordinary people like us, you know, we can't, you know, know everything, you know, in detail, but as much as possible, we should, you know, uh, find out what is really, what is it that is really necessary for that person. For example, look at some of the beggars. Or, or you know, there are a number of people who beg, but if you give them money, they'll drink. They'll use the money to get, in, you know, intoxicated. So that's not going to help them. So in that case, instead of you know, giving the money, give some food. So it depends, you know, it depends. Then also, in big cities like there are now these, 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 these days, there are professional beggars. <laughs> and some of them, I, I saw some of them, you know, they, you know, when you are you know, moving in a car or something, then at the car stop there somebody comes with shaking the head and all these hands is completely like wound and the pus is oozing out and it looks like horrible. But then I learned from somebody, this, this is not real wound, they make it. <laughs> look like that, you see? <laughs> so, so they are professional beggars, you know, they are manipulated by many others who are billionaires, millionaires, making these children, women back, but they earn the money, you know? So things like that, they are people like that. So you need to help in such a way that this will not become a cause for making more people beggars, right? You should help them so that gradually they are able to help themselves. So the best, best gift is education. That's why in Buddhism we are talking so much about giving proper teaching, proper education. Because if, you know, as, as you remember the, this, this line, you know, the fish. Uh, give, 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 give a person a fish, that, that may be good for one lunch, one dinner. But if you teach that person fishing, he'll be able to get a good job. So something like that. So analyze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, here. Yes, here. Huh? Whoever, I don't know. You decide, you decide. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for your teaching. Uh -huh. I have a request actually. Yeah. Uh, can we uh, read, can you read um, Refuge Man, uh, by praying every meeting? Yeah, yeah, organizers, and please take note of this. Yeah, and since uh, the teachings uh, connecting with Lama Tsunkapa, maybe sometimes we can yeah, uh, yeah. chant good, good, like good, good. Uh, Miktema Mantra, please. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. okay. I think I can read it. Um, Actually, I wanted to ask, uh, there are some times uh, like uh, while, uh, you know, just living the life, you feel that, uh, you fe you don't feel happy, but you know, it's not like, uh, it's not the happiness feeling. It's like a neutral or maybe some sadness, but uh, you, like the person cannot find out like what's the reason behind it. And uh, this happens very frequently, like a lot. Like uh, It's like you don't, you don't feel happy. It's not the happiness, but you couldn't find the reason for what it is, for whatever you are fa feeling. It's it's majorly uh, leaving the mind blank. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Majority people are like that. <laughs> they are just moving around, not sure what they are doing. You know. So at the end of the day, they don't. They feel a little bit empty. You know. So that is there with many people. With many people. I, rem I recall very clearly 
the Jap young Japanese boy with his two other friends came to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama many, many years back. And this young man told His Holiness that His Holiness, when I was a, you know, a student in the university, I used to study very hard so that I get very good mark, you know, uh, become one of the toppers so that I get the best job in a company. So I studied very hard. I was a topper. I get a very good job in a very good company. I'm still working in that company. But somehow I feel something missing in me, so I, I can't figure that out. Your Holiness, can you explain it? <laughs> His Holiness gave a very simple answer. He said, get more connected with people. <laughs> get more connected with people. This is what I'm saying. You know, if you really have friends, reliable friends, not everybody, reliable friends, and then also a little bit helping others, that will give you that sense of fulfillment. Not just money and things like that. Money and things may be important, but sometimes, you know, the more you get, the more you become stupid. The more you have to do running, you know, endless running, right? So therefore, the, the real source of satisfaction and happiness is as much as possible keeping in touch with yourself like meditation a little bit prayer recitation and then developing compassion love instill yourself with all this empower your all these inner resources then you will never feel lonely or, or or neutral whatever you call it so right now the problem is we are all kind of extrovert we are all running outside the inner house Nobody's there. It's like a house that has been deserted a long time back and it's dilapidating and cobwebs are there and dust collecting. Nobody is grooming, <laughs> cleaning it. Our, my, our inside is like that. That is the problem. So therefore, now you need to go more inside and be happy with yourself, number one. Then you will be happy with others. And now, in some cases, they, 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 feel, they, they develop this kind of empty feeling or neutral feeling because they think about death. Then they think, oh, one day I'm going to die, so what is the meaning of this life? Thereby, they also feel empty. That is wrong, again. Meaning of your life is not so much how long you live. The meaning of your life, purpose of your life is how you live today or tomorrow, not how long you live, <laughs> right? There is, I'll tell you one story, then we stop. There was a, a gentleman who lived, this is an Indian story. It's a gentleman who lived 1,000 years. Then in the course of his 1,000 years, he married 100 women and had 100 sons. The elder son was like 800 something years old. So when this father was 1,000 years old, the messenger of the death came and he said, you lived too long, now it's time to go. The father said, yes, I know I lived very long, <laughs> but I still want to live. So take my, my son, take one of my sons. So the messenger of the, the, the death goes to the, the eldest son. He says, yes, yes, I, I also want to live. Go to the next one. So this way he keeps you know, going down all the way Finally, to the 16-year-old son. When the 16-year-old son was approached, the 16-year-old child, he was, he was in a very, you know, happy mood and with great excitement, he said, yes, 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 I want to go. So the messenger of the death was shocked. When your father, all your elder sons don't want to go, why you get so excited to go? He said, I'm excited to go because when my father lived 1,000 years, my elder brothers lived so many years, after living so many years, if they didn't get anything, I don't think I'm going to get anything, so I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the question of how long you live, number one. Number two, death does not mean death of your mind. The death we are talking about is death of the body. There's no death to the mind. So there's another reason, you know, to to, to uh, fulfill the meaning of your life. 
ओके लंच टाइम थैंक यू